As you all sit here tonight, keep in mind that each of you have taken the first step. All of you have voluntarily accepted the responsibility of patient care for people with scleroderma. After tonight, you will be educated. Welcome everyone to our discussion regarding the scleroderma professional education program. This is a, the program is a collaboration among several organizations, which you see listed here. My name is Steve Rosenblum. I'm a project manager working for the Steffens Scleroderma Foundation. The presentation was prepared by members of our core team who you see listed here. But before we start, I'd like to introduce you to the members who are here and let them say hello for themselves. So, Jeffrey. Greetings from Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. My name is Jeffrey Brewer, a pharmacist and faculty in the Doctor of Pharmacy program. I am responsible for building interprofessional experiences for our pharmacy students and collaborating with interprofessional colleagues on a variety of projects and patient populations. Thanks, Amy. Hi everyone, my name is Amy. I'm from Buffalo, New York. Uh, I'm first and foremost a scleroderma patient for over 20 years. I'm also an advocate and have done a lot of uh, public speaking and raising awareness all over the country. I've worked with the Steffens Foundation for about four years now and have been an intricate part of the IPE as a keynote speaker. Um, I recently became a board member to the Steffens Foundation, and I also do a lot of work with the Tri-State Chapter, and I'm a board member on that, um, on the Tri-State Chapter as well. Thank you. Uh, Linda? My name is Linda Meenan. I was an educator for 33 years and am very passionate about scleroderma IPE and the education benefits for all. I am vice president of the Stephan Scleroderma Foundation and chair of its education and awareness committee. This committee works in close collaboration with our partners to produce our annual scleroderma IPE. Today, we are all most excited sharing our scleroderma IP journey with you. Thank you. Michelle? Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Morgan. I am a registered dietitian, nutritionist, dietetic internship director, and assistant professor of practice at Russell Sage College. I also am the secretary for the Stefan Scleroderma Foundation and have served as the liaison between the Foundation's Education Awareness Committee and the College's Interprofessional Education Committee. Thanks, Dr. Shapiro. Hi, I'm Lee Shapiro. I'm a rheumatologist, professor of medicine at Albany Medical College and the chief medical officer of the Stefan Scleroderma Foundation. My whole career has been devoted to taking care of individuals with scleroderma and uh, in particular, focusing on increasing awareness and improving the level of care. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, that's just a small portion of the many people who've worked to make the IPE possible, including planning groups from Stephens Foundation and the IPE team from Russell Sage College. We have other key team members shown here, a few people that have really contributed to the presentation and a special shout out to our friend, Bill Selnick, who is our video production consultant who pulled all of this together. Linda, would you mind giving us a little information about the Steffens Foundation? Sure, Steve. This is a little bit of history about the Ian Steffens Scleroderma Research Foundation, which is based in Albany, New York. The foundation supports two diseases, scleroderma and Dago's disease, was founded in 2010 through a mother's donation, honoring her daughter, Anne Steffens, for the purpose of making a difference in helping others who are living with scleroderma. Steffens is run by an 11 member board of directors. Our chief medical advisor is Dr. Lee Shapiro, and our associate medical advisor is Jessica Farrell, PharmD. Both are well known by the National Scleroderma Foundation. Key to Stefan's Foundation Scleroderma IPE 
is the fulfillment of the Stefan's mission statement and goals to promote scleroderma awareness and understanding, especially among healthcare professionals, and to encourage collaboration aimed at realizing our mission and goals. The goals of research, awareness, education, and the potential for earlier diagnosis are fully met with each scleroderma interprofessional education event. Thank you, Linda. Interprofessional education may be a new concept for some of you. So Jeffrey, would you mind telling us a little bit about it? It would be my pleasure, Steve. In 1999, the Institute of Medicine published To Air is Human. This report was published in the middle of my residencies and led to many medication safety initiatives in health systems across the United States. Fast forward to 2010, the World Health Organization published its framework on interprofessional education and collaborative practice. You can see the heart of their work on this slide. Learners from two or more professions learning about, from, and with each other to enter the workplace as members of a collaborative practice team. Also, leaders focus on skills in four domains, interprofessional communication, teams and teamwork, roles and responsibilities, and values and ethics. Around the same time, six national associations representing the professional schools founded the Interprofessional Education Collaborative. IPAC, as it's commonly called, published its first guidance in 2011 and updated in 2013 and 2016. They are currently in process of updating for the future. With all this history and buildup over the last 20 years, we can clearly see that scleroderma, with its multi-organ nature, complex functional challenges, and interpatient variability, is the perfect foundation to bring the entire healthcare team together to collaborate, communicate, and elevate our current education and practice models. Thank you, Jeffrey. This program is unique in a number of ways. Linda, would you give us some background? Yes, I can tell you how it all got started. A little IPE history regarding scleroderma IPE. In 2016 and 2017, foundation board members searched and investigated for two years to develop a specific program to achieve its education and awareness goals among healthcare professionals. In 2018, Stephens leveraged an existing IPE partnership between Russell Sage College and the Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. And the scleroderma IPE began in March of 2018. The scleroderma IPE that was developed shifted to a patient-centric experience and focus where approximately 30 patients participated in each IPE with a minimum of one patient for every six to eight students. After four partnered IPEs, 800 healthcare students from eight different disciplines are now scleroderma aware. Our first virtual scleroderma IPE was this past March. Later in the presentation, you will learn about the strengths of both live and virtual IPEs. On this next slide, we'll see the benefits for scleroderma IPE. And boy, do the benefits abound for all involved. <clears throat> Patients are playing an active role in educating healthcare professionals and it's paying off. I can share a little story with you that's proof. A scleroderma patient going to a new physical therapy appointment expected as usual to introduce her scleroderma disease to the new physical therapist. To her amazement, the physical therapist already knew about scleroderma and how to help her. Further amazing, both had been prior scleroderma IPE participants. Patients truly feel a sense of empowered advocacy. From my own experience, after a 2019 IPE, the hall was empty except for a few patients and a few others. And then I asked one of the patients, why are you still here? And he answered, this evening was so great for me, I hate to leave. 
Patients welcome the knowledge gained hearing what healthcare disciplines can do for them. At each IPE, opportunity exists for earlier scleroderma diagnosis among the 200 students present. To quote Dr. Lee S. Shapiro, some of the students present may be the first to recognize its features and the first to suggest a possible diagnosis. For students, they are learning about, with, and from each other collaboratively. This is really what IPE is all about for those students. Students are meeting their professional competency requirements. They are practicing active communication skills of listening, observing, questioning directly with a scleroderma patient. A student was questioned, what was the most important aspect of this event? The student answered, you can read about this sort of thing in a book. You can learn about it from a class lecture, but to actually hear firsthand experiences, to actually see scleroderma differences and similarities, that to me is what really brings what I should learn for the future in identifying scleroderma in my own practice. Another student answered, having the patients come to this event was really helpful for every profession and discipline that was here. You get everything that scleroderma patients really deal with daily. Lastly, student research projects and interest in scleroderma have been developed. One example is a master's thesis on IPE measurements by Russell Sage graduate students. Okay, Steve, back to you. Thank you, Linda. Michelle, why do you think scleroderma is an ideal fit for interprofessional education? There are many reasons as to why scleroderma is a model condition for interprofessional education. First, treatment of scleroderma requires the engagement of a wide variety of healthcare professionals, of which interprofessional collaboration is necessary to meet the needs of the patient and their family members. The rheumatologist must work closely with other medical and allied health professionals to manage manifestations of the conditions as well as symptoms. Individuals with scleroderma are often well-informed about the disease and highly engaged within the community. And finally, the presentation and symptoms associated with scleroderma are highly individualized. Therefore, the students engaged in the interprofessional education event are reminded that the individual is who you are treating and not solely the condition. This can be translated to all medical conditions as well. Thank you, Michelle. Linda, would you tell us a little bit more about the program? Oh, sure. On this slide, you'll see the essential elements necessary to create and conduct a successful scleroderma IPE. You need a basic three-prong collaboration between a scleroderma organization that has an education and awareness mission and a corresponding committee organized to fulfill that mission. Stephens has an education awareness committee consisting of nine members. Our academic college partners have an IPE committee of 10. Second, on one or more academic healthcare institutions are needed, offering advanced healthcare degrees and who have strong experience or interest in conducting an IPE. Third, a scleroderma center, or it could be a clinic or an organization who are a source of participating individuals living with scleroderma. Other necessary elements are patients as partners, who are willing to share their journey of living with scleroderma. Healthcare professional students, of course. And lastly, something you wouldn't normally think about. There is a need for resources for learning about scleroderma, for the students and the professors to use, for pre-event preparation and post-event projects. Examples of what I mean are uh, videos on scleroderma and certainly written by some experts in extensive bibliography. 
there is a very strong advantage to having these scleroderma resources available online. On this slide, you will see the primary agenda program elements that go into a scleroderma IPE program. There's always an introduction of the partners who each emphasize and speak to the importance of healthcare collaboration and teamwork. The overall job of the keynote speaker is to impactfully introduce the theme to be covered and to get the participants motivated to talk and think with each other about scleroderma and to understand the importance of collaborative team care. The keynote speaker should incorporate stories about living with scleroderma, how serious this disease really is, and how important an awareness event is to the entire scleroderma community. At the, at the roundtable discussions, or in the virtual case, in breakout rooms, this is where it really all comes together and happens. As patients and students come directly together, patients relate their scleroderma journeys and students learn again about with and from each other and the patients. In this team setting, working collaboratively with other disciplines, students practice their effective communication skills again of active listening, observing, and questioning with real patients. Next, a facilitated simulation interview is held between one patient and one student from each of the healthcare disciplines in front of all event participants. The interview is then appraised, pros and cons are given by a communications patient's simulation expert. Last but not least is our expert panel comprised of professionals from each participating discipline. They're present to answer student questions and to speak examples of their discipline's best practice for quality scleroderma patient care. On this slide, as you can see, there are many supporting elements. In the left-hand column, the third one down, you'll find a novel theme supporting element for a live IPE. It's a nutrition table for all participants that contains scleroderma oriented drinks and food samplings that meet the dietary needs of those living with scleroderma. All of these supporting elements that you see on this page have been necessary to our scleroderma IPE events. Steve, back to you. Thank you, Linda. So now we're going to see a couple videos to give you a flavor for the speakers at the event, including some clips from Stefan's chief medical officer, Dr. Lee Shapiro, and highlights of a Zoom speech that was given by keynote speaker Amy Geetson. Note that the full speech is available to you online. We had to edit it to make it short enough for the presentation. Scleroderma is a disease we don't recognize quickly enough, nor one for which we do enough. Because it can alter appearance, cause pain and stiffness, limit hand function, create difficulty ingesting, digesting, and enjoying food, cause cough and shortness of breath, and because it is lifelong, presently incurable, and sometimes life-shortening, it can be terrifying, depressing, isolating, and disabling. For now, we don't have pills, injections, or infusions that cure the disease. Though the treatments we do have may ease symptoms, slow progression, and lengthen life. Until we have a cure, we need your help, not only to speed diagnosis, but to use your skills to make life easier for these patients. Be it by improving hand function, preserving mobility and strength, explaining medications and helping patients access, access them, helping individuals maintain weight, and cope emotionally with changes in physical capacity and appearance. Many answers won't come from old texts or even from research labs. 
the individuals with scleroderma from their own long experience with the disease are apt to offer coping strategies that may benefit many others. So listen to them, not only for their questions, but for their answers. Your own focus, concern, and professional training may put each of you in the position to create original solutions. When you do, we are happy to partner with you in researching and potentially implementing your ideas. Thank you. There are over 80 autoimmune diseases in the world today, 100 types of arthritis, 200 connective tissue disorders, and 3,000 skin diseases. But nothing can compare to a life with scleroderma. Last month, I celebrated my 20-year anniversary of my initial diagnosis of systemic scleroderma. Now, it wasn't necessarily a celebration. It was more of a moment of mourning of the life I lived before my diagnosis and a moment of gratitude that I had made it this far. Was it easy? Absolutely not. I can remember days not wanting to even be on this earth anymore. Days were lifting my head off my pillow was the toughest of challenges. Days I would have given just about anything to not be in my body. Living with scleroderma is the hardest challenge I have been through in my life ever. But each day I wake up and do it again and again. Scleroderma is a disease that affects around 250 people per million. That is only around 20 newly diagnosed patients per million a year. That number seems so small compared to the hundreds of people I've met over the last 20 years who, like myself, have been fighting daily to gain the upper hand with this disease. 20 years later, we have made amazing strides medically. There are treatments available for patients that did not exist in my early stage of diagnosis. We have a ton of literature and knowledgeable websites filled with educational information about this disease to help guide patients and caregivers. And most importantly, we have support. Like I mentioned before, this disease affects almost every part of my body. That makes it extremely hard to treat with just one doctor or clinician. As a patient, I have over 12 different specialists and they all work together to treat me as a whole instead of individually by my parts. Had I not found a team willing to work seamlessly together and coordinate my care, I would not be here speaking to all of you. It is the key to a successful managed patient with scleroderma. Now, over the summer, I had a health scare, a pretty big one at that. Out of nowhere, I had a cardiac event called a ventricular tachycardia. I was rushed to the hospital by ambulance during the height of COVID without my support system and without being able to contact any of my healthcare team because they're out of state. Had I seen one medical professional who I knew, who I thought knew anything about scleroderma during the entire four day stay, maybe I would have felt confident to hear the treatment plan they wanted to prescribe. Maybe I wouldn't have felt so alone and like I had to fight every day to get my meds given to me how I'd taken them for the last 20 years. Maybe I might not have been awake every night in the hospital in case anyone came in my room to make sure that they knew I had scleroderma and that I needed a different type of needle to draw my blood or that some of my pills needed to be cut in half so I could swallow them. So I've said all that to say this. We need you, each of you, to see us, hear our struggle, have an open mind, and be willing to champion us moving forward. The more medical professionals that learn about scleroderma and what it is and how it needs to be treated, the better it will be for all of us out here living with this disease and patiently waiting for the day when we have a cure. We as patients have accepted the challenge of living a life full of pain, struggle, loss, and disability. It's up to all of you to accept the challenge to educate yourselves about scleroderma and then pass it along to others in the medical field so that we as patients can receive the right care for us please be willing to do that. Be willing to work together, to ask questions, to look things up, and to not be afraid to say, I don't know. 
all of these things allow for growth, not only as a person, but as a medical professional. Be willing to treat all diseases, even the ones that you may not have heard of. Are you willing to accept that challenge? Our lives depend on it. They depend on all of you. Thank you. A large portion of the event is focused on interviewing skills. Here's a video of Heather Friends from Albany Medical College providing students with some interviewing best practices, followed by some highlights from an interview simulation filmed using Zoom in order to replicate the virtual IPE conducted this year. Again, the full video will be available online. I'm gonna talk a little bit about questioning skills and what I think is important when it comes to talking with patients and talking amongst one another as a team. <clears throat> the first thing that's really important is to always make sure that you're really getting your patient's story, right? And that's not always easy. Um, patients come in with a story, but it's not always the whole picture. It's what they're seeing as symptoms. I think especially those of us who have scleroderma, sometimes we're having things go on in our lives and we're like, is this scleroderma? Does this have to do with this? Or So really making sure that you're, first of all, asking your patient a lot of open-ended questions. Tell me what's been going on. What other symptoms have you been experiencing? Tell me more about that. But then don't be afraid to follow up on that information that they give you, okay? Very often our patients give us what I like to call clinical cues, and we overlook them because we're ready with our next question, right? We're like, oh, I know what I have to ask next. I know what I have to ask next. And we forget to listen. Okay, so really make sure that you listen to your patient, hear what they're saying, and then follow up appropriately on that. We talk a lot about be sure you take a social history, but I like to really consider that more as contextual features. So I live in the cold weather, so how hard is it for me in the winter time, right? How hard is it for Amy in the winter time? Does she have someone who can help her with meal preparation? Those types of things are really important in scleroderma. So don't get so caught up in the medicine that you don't figure out the person. Okay. And finally, it's about collaboration, right? And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So when it comes to collaboration, one of the things I want you to be thinking about tonight when you're sitting in these wonderful groups of all these different disciplines is a listening one another's perspective. I can guarantee that you know different things. Think about your role when you're talking about your collaboration tonight. Talk to each other about how can the pharmacist help the nutritionist, help the, the um, nursing student, all of you. How can you come together to support your patients in a way that is collaborative? Elicit one another's perspective and expertise. That's really important. Think about how important it's going to be to make sure that you document your visit well so that your next provider that's seeing it is getting that information. So that's one of the things I would like you to talk about when you're setting up your questions is how would we relay this information to one another? How would we relay what we found out from the other provider to our patient when we started to move forward with a new treatment plan? So now what we're gonna do is we're going to be doing a, a simulated interview. Our patient will be Amy. Um, when we're doing this, I just want you to know that this is a safe place to practice your skills. If you get stuck and you're not sure where to go next or what question to ask, you can always just call a pause. Um, and I may call a pause as well, just to talk about some of the questions that are that are being asked and and think back to uh, the interviewing skills that I talked about before, and we will um, we'll follow up on those. So we have Amy ready to go, um, and I just need a volunteer who would like to go first. I will. Great, thank you, Michelle. So I will leave it to you, and you can ask a couple of questions, and then we'll talk about your questions. So whenever you're ready. Hi, Amy. Um, my name is Michelle. I'm a dietetic intern. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, my first question for you is, how would you say your condition has impacted your relationship with food? So I think for me, I've been a patient for 20 years. Um, so it's been a lot of ups and downs, especially with what I eat, what I can eat, what I can't eat. So in the beginning, there wasn't a lot of impact aside from having GERD or acid reflux. Um, so just being careful not to eat past eight o'clock, having my head of my bed elevated. Um, but as I moved into the progression of the disease, it's been more difficult to find things that agree with me and that are healthy. And, you know, I think when you're sick, 
you don't really have control over a lot of things in your life. So food is one of those things that I like to control. So really great questions. You really allowed Amy to speak in her own voice by asking that open-ended question at the top about the relationship with food, which I thought was just a, a really, really great term. And then you got quite a bit of information. And then she, then you asked a more pointed question. Um, and you really found out about Amy. All right. Hi, Amy. I'm Samantha Sattler, a third year medical student. Um, and I was just going to ask you a few questions today. Sure. Welcome. So my question is, if you could talk me through some of the pharmaceutical or home remedies that you use to treat your various symptoms of scleroderma. Um, well, I think as a patient, you know, you're on a lot of medication. You just are. There's a lot of different um, symptoms, like you said, that you have. So I think for me... I don't do a lot of home remedies just because my disease is very complicated. I have a lot of um, heart condition, lung condition. So I have a lot of symptoms that don't really mix with a lot of home remedies. So I kind of just basically stay to my prescription medicines. Great, great questions. Um, getting a big overview about these medications. And again, the impact on life of that, just having to be able, I mean, dry eyes alone is a challenge to deal with. And scleroderma patients do take a lot of medications. It was really nice that you left into medications off of nutrition, because one of the questions that we probably would get to in this, and we could get to is, how does she manage taking all those medications? If she has swallowing issues, if she has reflux issues, how does she manage that on a day-to-day -day basis? And does she struggle with that? The other thing I really liked about your opening, Samantha, is that you didn't just ask about prescription medications. You know, it's not just prescription medications that patients are taking. So I really, really thought it was fantastic that, um, that you, you asked about that as well. So, um, I really, I really appreciated, I appreciated that and that you offered an opportunity for empathy. Um, both of you just did a wonderful job of being empathic, giving her a safe place and being patient. All right, thank you both. We will look for another volunteer to continue our interview for us in just a moment. As mentioned earlier, another important part of the IPE is the roundtable discussion where students have an opportunity to speak to a patient and or caregiver in a more intimate group setting. In the live event, there can be over 30 table discussions going on at once. The following recording is a simulation to replicate the way it worked in this year's virtual IPE. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Beck Stevens, and this is my husband, Jake. And we are, um, well, I am a patient with limited scleroderma. So I'm a little different probably than the rest of the patients you'll see during this event. Um, because I don't look like I have scleroderma. Um, most of my symptoms are on the inside. Um, I was diagnosed in 2007 with limited scleroderma. And for years, my only impact was that I had Raynaud's. And then um, over time, I've started to see more and more um, decline of different functions of my body. So um, I'll turn it over to you guys now for some questions. And you can also ask Jake questions if you'd like. Hi, um, I'd be happy to start. My name is Samantha Sattler. I'm a third year medical student. Nice to meet you both. Nice to meet, nice you. To meet you. Um, my question for you is you mentioned that you know you you've noticed some changes recently. What symptoms do you use to monitor? The progression of your disease? Um, and then this is kind of a twofold question, um, but how do you communicate those changes with your providers so that you can best convey your quality of life and, you know, your state of health at any given time? Sure. So I just kind of pay attention to my body. So for example, um, in the fall, I started noticing that my hands were getting a little tighter, um, that I was starting to lose some of the functions of my fingers, squeezing things, opening things. And so um, I have my chart set up with a doctor at Johns Hopkins. Um, I also see um, Dr. Shapiro in Albany twice a year. Um, and then I have a local rheumatologist. So between all of them, I kind of, that's how I just manage. Um, but yeah, I'm watching different symptoms. Uh, my GI system is probably what's most affected 
And so I just pay attention to what's going on um, and send messages. Maintaining regular appointments is definitely um, a good practice, especially for someone newly diagnosed that won't know what symptoms to look for and the progression initially. Thank you for sharing. Um, my name is Michelle. I'm a nutrition student. I'm a dietetic intern. Um, I noticed that you said that you were having issues with your GI tract. Could you explain to me a little bit about um, what you're experiencing with that? Sure. Well, um, I've so I've had a lot of testing done and pretty much nothing works. My esophagus 100% failed. Um, the esophageal motility test. Um, my system doesn't really process food the way it's supposed to. Um, I One of my tests, they did a test where I ate eggs that had radioactive dye. And four days later, a lot of that was still there. So um, just nothing really moves in my system. So, um, so yeah, so I actually work with a dietitian now um, that to help me with setting up a better dietary system um, so that I'm eating more real foods, I guess, um, because what had happened was because of acid, I was just eating carbs because carbs don't cause acid and I was great. So I just eat lots and lots of carbs. Well, that's not very good for getting things to move in your system. So, so that's what I'm doing. I'm glad to hear that the dietitian seems to be healthy. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Um, I'll go next. Um, my name's Heather. I'm an occupational therapy student. Um, it's really great to be, meet both of you. Um, I, w while listening to what you were talking about, I would love to know a little more about how your scleroderma symptoms affect your everyday living. So those everyday routines of, you know, self-management, home care, work, um, and just kind of have an idea of what you would value getting more independence with if you ever were to go to an occupational therapist? So at this point, um, I haven't lost enough functioning to not be able to do most of what I want to do, which I'm very fortunate about. Um, but it does wear me out. And probably Jake suffers from that the most because by the time I get home from work, I'm done. I teach middle school. And so um, I would say that's one of the bigger impacts. But in terms of showering and dressing, I'm able to do that. I do have to be warm. Um, that's a big issue with me. And um, especially if I've been in a situation where I've been cold, that can totally zap me. Do you want to talk more about? <laughs> well, um, one one thing that uh, Beck does see is, is a physical therapist and some of what they're doing might be crossover to occupational therapy, especially with regard to helping her stretch uh, the areas of the skin that are tightening. Yeah, definitely. We we do see a lot of that and we can do hand therapy too. So um, that's great to know though. I'm glad that that's working out. Thank you. All right. Who wants to go next? Hi, my name is Hannah. I'm a pharmacy student. It's great to meet you both. Nice, nice so, to meet you. Um, I just have a question regarding medications. So do you have any vitamins or herbals or other substances that you use to improve your health? So um, again, working with the dietitian and working with my doctors too, it's, it's hard because I'm taking a lot of medicine. Um, I'm actually not immunosuppressed, uh, which is uh, when you have limited scleroderma, they really hesitate to do um, immunosuppression meds until more major organs are involved. So I'm not on any immunosuppressant, but um, I take this biome. Um, which has been studied with scleroderma uh, to help with digestion. Uh, and then I take a multivitamin just because right now I'm trying to lose some weight, but for me to lose weight, I have to drop calories a lot. So they wanted me to take a multivitamin just to make sure I'm getting what I need. Um, and then I take fish oils and um, calcium because I'm on two proton pump inhibitors twice a day. So they really want me to make sure I'm taking additional calcium as well. Does anyone have any follow-up questions for Jake? Um, I would love to know. I know that, you know, having scleroderma is definitely a hard thing to go through, but I would love to know how, you know, Jake deals with that too. Well, I can say that it hasn't been easy on us. Mm -hmm. um, just in general, I mean, it affected our relationship initially. 
um, partially because I didn't even understand how the disease was impacting her. Uh, um, secondly, it's exacerbated some things in me that that um, that showed that maybe I had some mental health stuff, but I didn't really have to deal with most of that because there, I didn't have stressors in my life that were as impactful as uh, as the changes in her health. Yeah, that I can't imagine, but I'm glad that you guys have worked through it and you guys seem like you have a really good support system going. So that's great. Yeah, absolutely. One of the biggest support systems to us is our church and um, our friends and, and our faith that that's really what helps us get through each day. That's great. Dr. Shapiro, would you tell us a little bit about the expert panel at the IPE? Certainly. At some point after diagnosis, every individual with scleroderma to greater or lesser degree thinks, where can I find someone who knows about this disease and can answer my questions? Where can I find a physician, a pharmacist, a hand therapist, a dietitian who knows my disease? Has my nurse ever encountered someone else with this? Where can I find a social worker or psychologist who knows the challenges of this lifelong illness? Creating this cadre of scleroderma familiar providers is our mission. The doctor treating an individual with scleroderma and that individual share a need for a team of providers to work with in order to fully address issues arising from the disease. But those providers must be interested in and informed about scleroderma, or the patient will always find himself or herself in the role of educator before he or she can get help. Often a single encounter with an individual with scleroderma is enough to prompt a provider to learn more about the disease and how he or she can provide that help. But too often that help, that help comes only for the next person they see, not you, the very first. That is why we hope through this program to make the first encounter happen now. So tomorrow's health providers are already scleroderma aware. Scleroderma is not an organ specific disease. Physicians in multiple specialties must be involved. Yes, a rheumatologist, but also more often than not, a gastroenterologist, pulmonologist, cardiologist, occasionally an orthopedic surgeon, a nephrologist, and a wound care physician. Well-informed pharmacists, hand therapists, nutritionists, nurses, and mental health providers can all ease the burden and isolation of this disease. The IPE expert panel is structured to make the need for a collaborating team and the value of disease-specific expertise clear to students, so clear that they will remember this day and be ready to assist those living with scleroderma. I literally had a woman say uh, the other day to me, uh, I said, it looks like you're doing pretty well. Your hands look like they're not terribly involved. She goes, oh, I'm so relieved. I thought this was a death sentence. And, you know, do not underestimate the power of your words and do not underestimate the power of your attitude in bringing um, hope and also a positive frame of mind to the person that you've been entrusted to work with. And they will teach you. How is the patient doing in terms of supports and health, but how are their caregivers doing? How is their child, their spouse, et cetera? As I said at the table, it takes a village to be chronically ill. Everybody is affected. And how well a patient can be compliant has a lot to do with who surrounds them. When you develop a rapport with your patients, it's okay to tell them that you don't know the answer, which is something that Amy mentioned. And that, but you will work to find the answer for them. So I think that is one of the most important things that you can do as a new clinician. Every patient or every person is an individual. And even though someone may have a diagnosis of a disease, that does not mean that they experience that disease or symptoms related to it the same way. So especially from a nutrition standpoint, care is going to be highly individualized. So it's important to listen and not to generalize or assume that just because someone has this diagnosis, they are going to have these subsets of symptoms or concerns. Jeffrey, what was the student response like to the IPE? So anecdotally, the student response uh, has been very strong right from the beginning. 
Um, and of course, just like anything else in academic medicine, pharmacy, all of our disciplines, uh, we've been getting better as we go. Uh, so the first four events were face-to-face, -face, synchronous, and this last event was synchronous online. Uh, and so the data from this last event, we had 202 students, 68 of whom completed their response for a 34% return. Uh, we gave uh, them time to respond at the end of the conference. We also gave them a QR code and a link. Uh, we used a five point Likert scale from terrible and poor uh, up through good and excellent. Uh, so we consistently found that our students prefer patient exposure. And you'll see here, there's a first patient interview and a second patient interview. Um, and the way we have it structured, that's separated by a learning event. Um, and so uh, we do like the multi the multimodal setup, and that's what really what our data shows us, um, that the students really prefer the patients to us boring experts. Uh, of note, uh, the qualitative data suggests that while the expert panel was the lowest preference on this list, uh, we also know that that's likely because of the structure uh, of how what we went to this, this time, and so, um, there were multiple comments on the lack of time with the expert panel and how they, they didn't, weren't able to answer all of their questions because of the timing. So we'll continue to look at this and continue to get better with, uh, with next year's event. Thanks. Patient feedback was also incredibly strong. Michelle, would you give us some highlights? Absolutely. A survey was disseminated to patients and caregivers that participated in the event. Of the 16 respondents, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive as displayed on this slide. What do you consider important or unique about scleroderma that students from these various disciplines learned? From um, so that's why I think it's good that they see many, many of us here and to visually see how different it is per person and I think that's one of the unique things about scleroderma is not one treatment is gonna help every person and not every person goes through the same stuff. What do you feel are the benefits for students and patients in participating in this scleroderma IPE? I think that um, scleroderma is such a, a rare disease that um, you know people getting here and going over their symptoms, what happened, you know, how the disease progressed, I think it's very important um, for our new um, faces of our medical field to be able to recognize um, maybe potentially a rare disease. Um, for me, just the interaction with the uh, students here, getting their knowledge and insight, uh, learning, f listening to them and learning from them is a big uh, piece for me. Jeffrey, how do you feel the virtual event compared with the live event? So as I said in a couple of slides ago, we had three events uh, that were live and then this last event that was virtual. And so we're still digesting a little bit um, on this. Uh, we've had multiple discussions within our group. Um, so certainly this area has generated significant discussion. Uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly what that means. Um, one of my take home points is that uh, it likely depends on how you learn. Um, and so the format that you engage best with uh, likely has to do with how you interact with people and how you like to learn. Uh, as we've learned from the COVID-19 uh, learning pandemic um, interactions, um, the, some of the things that we've pulled out, uh, uh, our team as a whole believes that the live events create a better sense of community, although that was also uh, picked up on in the small groups. Uh, and you saw an example of that um, a couple of videos ago. Uh, students were better able to observe patients. And, and this idea is really from a diagnostic and from an inspection kind of piece. Uh, it's much easier to see when the patient's sitting at your table, as opposed to when they're a little box on the Zoom. And so, Clearly, there's a benefit to the live piece and, and that part of the interaction. Um, greater focus in local resources. So when we can get patients, students, 
learners and experts that are all from the same area. There's a power in that combination. Um, and uh, when we switch to the virtual side, uh, there's also power in being able to bring experts and patients from afar to your learners. And so we really are seeing how both the live and the virtual side uh, have benefits um, to the structure. And we're really looking forward to rolling both of these out into the future. Thank you. Michelle, what are some lessons that the team has taken away from your experiences so far? The next three slides represent important considerations that should take place based on lessons learned from our experience. It is crucial to begin planning for the event, ideally a year in advance. All stakeholders must be involved in planning to ensure the objectives are met for all parties. Identifying a liaison to communicate between the foundation and college committee allows for continuity and streamlines the planning process. Patient participants and caregivers should be identified as soon as the date for the event is set to ensure that adequate time for recruitment of the number of participants needed takes place. In the event of last minute cancellations, having a group of patients and caregivers on standby to participate as needed has been helpful. In addition, having an identified group of patients that wish to participate for future events eases the planning process. During the event, it is important to build enough time for breaks given that it is two and a half hours in length. And based on previous feedback regarding the expert panel as Jeffrey previously discussed, here are some considerations. The expert panel should be advised to provide the audience with brief insights about their discipline with respect to scleroderma. Given that there are 200 or more students participating, many questions are generated for the expert panel. It is imperative to allow adequate time for the questions to be answered or reduce the number of questions the students can ask during this segment. Consider adding a case study to provide the opportunity for the panelists to share their expertise and have the audience witness them working as an interprofessional team in real time. During the roundtable discussions that Steve discussed, also called interprofessional team patient interviews, we could designate facilitators to assist both the patients and the students in keeping the conversation on track this could be done using patients or students as facilitators. However, whomever is designated must be provided with appropriate guidance and training as to how to serve in this role. Providing moderators at each roundtable may also be considered. And for a virtual event, ensure complete attendance is taken and that the Zoom session is recorded. After the event, it is important that there is an opportunity for follow-up to allow for the expert panel to answer any unanswered questions due to time constraints. Post-event meetings with key stakeholders offer an opportunity for continuous quality improvement. And lastly, eliciting feedback using different modalities such as post-event surveys or focus groups from all parties involved will ensure that there is follow-up and identify opportunities for growth for future events. Thank you, Michelle. So where do we go from here? The team has already begun planning for 2022's IPE using lessons learned and feedback to continuously improve the event. In addition, we're looking for ways to replicate the event at other scleroderma centers so that we are creating an online handbook or ebook to act as a how-to guide. We're also seeking grant funding to help assist with that process and creating a database of shared resources who would potentially be available to assist with other events. If you are interested in considering this or want to learn more, or if you have any feedback that you think that we might want to leverage for our own IPEs, go to the survey indicated here. You can get there by the URL that's listed or you can use the QR code 
to answer the survey and complete the form. This link will be available in handouts that you can um, you can bring down from the site as well. In fact, this entire presentation will be available online through the system at the conference that you can download if you want to follow up on any of this. Thank you all for your time today, and thank you for the opportunity at the Scleroderma Foundation for allowing us to tell our story. You know what, I think it was really awesome because this was my first time coming and I was just really grateful, you know, to be here. You know, once I got here and once I sat and listened to the students, I was really grateful because they cared and I loved that they cared and they, they really uh, made me feel comfortable and they made me feel good.